software as a service player. I like to think of us as a companion to the cube. We're here every morning trying to extract the signal from the noise. Where the cube excels in event coverage, we're working to bring that experience to you consistently every morning. We use the top stories of the day to provide you with breaking analysis so that you can forecast future trends. Uh, we're here before you even wake up. We're creating a fundamental change in news coverage, laying the foundation and setting the standard. And this is just the beginning. Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante. We're here at Knowledge, the conference for ServiceNow users. And we're at the Aria Hotel. We're in Las Vegas. Earlier today, we're broadcasting uh, SAP Sapphire. SAP Sapphire is on SiliconANGLE 2, so you can check that coverage out. But we're here with uh, the whole team, the CUBE team. Jeff Frick is here, my co-host for this week. We'll be broadcasting live today, tomorrow, and part of Thursday. We got ServiceNow executives, but more importantly, we got tons of ServiceNow customers coming on. But we've been talking about all week, uh, Jeff, about this single system of record, the sort of secret sauce behind uh, uh, ServiceNow. Yes, it's a cloud platform, yes, it's SaaS, but this notion of a single record database, CMDB, uh, a configuration management database, it sounds trivial, it's not. Chris Pope is here, he's the director of product management for ServiceNow. We're going to double click on this notion of single <laughs> record. Chris, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much for having us. Great to have you here, guys. So uh, it's going to be exciting. Yeah, and we're thrilled to be here. We're, Jeff and I were walking around last night talking to customers, talking to prospective customers. Um, a lot of excitement. I heard the figure that 30% of the audience is, is prospective that's correct. Yep. customers. That's a, that's a nice number. So <clears throat> hopefully your sales guys are here with, you know. It's time to go to work. Yeah, yeah, it's time to go, <laughs> go to work, right. So. Um, Let's talk about this notion of a, of a CMDB. We hear a lot about it, it sounds pretty straightforward. How come everybody doesn't have one? Well, I think you know, a lot of people try and have one and there's so many disparate data sources in IT now and you know, with big data and data exploding and data centers growing worldwide, it's kind of how do you wrap your arms around this stuff? And you know, having that single source of truth, no, it's great you can collect the data and bring it together, but can you truly trust it? And, you know, if you're going to use it to drive decisions and impact analysis, risk analysis, and you know, make changes in your business in an agile way, well, it can't all be in Bob's head who's been here 30 years. You know, Bob's <laughs> going to go away at some point. And you know, if you're driving workflow and you're making decisions on a daily, even a minute by minute basis in some occasions, you, know, you need good trusted data in a single source of truth. And then people don't worry about the data now. They focus on delivering the tasks, the services, or whatever it is they're implementing knowing that you know, they've got an accurate record they can trust and move forward with. Yeah, so um, again, it's, it sounds so straightforward, but it's not trivial to build a platform that is flexible, that yep. you, can, you can design pretty much any business process around it. How is it that you guys have been able to successfully do what nobody else seems to have been able to do? You know, I think one of the big things is you know, it's, it's organic. We, we have one platform, one single system of record, one database, one data model. And I think you know, a lot of the legacy vendors, and you know, I'm sure others have talked about this a little bit, have grown up through M&A and there's a lot of glue. I mean, we have no glue, right? It's core. And when you know, Fred, who's our founder, um, you know, designed the system and put it together, it was with a focus not necessarily on the technology, but what's the easiest way to complete the task I need to complete? And that's kind of core of, of what we do and why we do. And if you can do it in three steps, do it in three. You don't need 10, you don't need 20, and, and really focus on what you need to accomplish the task versus the nice to haves. And I think you know, a lot of CMDB projects fail because they're seen as a technology issue versus, well, you know, we're running a workshop tomorrow on this. What do you need to drive process or make decisions? Have that data available. The rest of it could be useful at a point in time to make an additional decision or you know, maybe you need a tiebreaker, but for this task right here, right now, I can make a decision, I can move on. And, we make it very easy for you to have that single system of record and 
you don't need to integrate with many other things. It's all there. It's really, if you can draw it on a board, you can implement it in service now. But what you find with a lot of customers who are kind of less agile in nature and a little bit monolithic is they struggle to even draw it on the board, mm. right? And therefore putting it in a tool will only help you fail faster, right? So if you go back to figuring out what it is you actually want to do, then use the tool to accelerate and automate, you've got a much higher chance of success. So that's interesting because I've been saying all, all week, and I came in here with the premise that the real interesting business impact of ServiceNow is that it allows me to change my business processes the way I want to run my business processes. I don't have to design them around some module or say, oh, we'll, we'll lose this feature if we right. can't do that. So, so that's critical, but you're saying start with the whiteboard. Yep. Start there and figure out your business and then we'll, we'll be able to accommodate yep. virtually anything. Is it yeah. really that flexible? It is, and you know, I've been a customer three times, so I've kind of got the war stories, and <laughs> I've worked with the dinosaurs out there, and you know, um, made the dinosaurs extinct in a lot of accounts I've worked in, and I work with a lot of customers, and you know, it's easy to focus on the technology, right? It's here, it's very available, consumer-led and driven, but it's, you know, if you step back and say, what problem do you actually want to solve, and let's draw the picture. And even in the workshop I'm running tomorrow, we have 30 whiteboards in the session, and we're going to make the audience get up and work and design and draw and solve the problem, and then we'll build it in the solution during the session, live on stage. And because we've taken away a lot of those things of you know the infrastructure, the data center, managing the tin, it's just not cool anymore, right? Nobody really wants to do it. Um, you know, they can focus on solving the problem, not wow, it's going to take me six weeks to install servers and databases and storage. All that's gone away, and it's like, okay, if I can draw this, then I can draw it in the tool, and I can make it work, and I can give it to my end users in a very consumer-like way, and off they go, they can consume it on an iPad, a mobile device, whatever it's going to be. That's the natural behavior they have now of interacting with software. So why should it be any different in the enterprise? And clearly, you know, that's a big mantra for Fred and what he does, and how he drives us to do things. Um, and, you know, and, and that's why we've got this phenomenal success. So, so when you go into a customer for a new customer implementation, they obviously been doing things away the, before you got yep. there. So is it Greenfield, let's start with the whiteboard and leave those in places? How do you displace the way they've done it now? Are you, yep. in, are you doing so I think, data integration from what they had? Are you sitting over the top? Yeah, so we, you know, we come out of the box, you know, aligned to ITIL and ITSM best practices, but it's a framework, it's kind of, you know, this is great, but now where do you go with it? What do you want to do? And every customer is slightly different, but maybe the core 70, 80% is pretty consistent. Um, and then it's about, you know, I talk a lot about being disruptive. Challenge the way of thinking. Just because you've done it that way for 20 years, doesn't mean it's the right way to do it going forward. And I was just meeting with a customer downstairs on exactly this, and you know, let's sit down and try and solve the problem. Let's figure out the what. What is it you want to do and why? And then the how is the technology to deliver that solution. Right, right. And then if the technology enables you to do those things easier, even better, because you can solve the next problem. And you know, we, we make it as interactive as we can um, and try and learn from them what they actually want to achieve. IT is very good at proposing solutions, but they're not always sure what question's being asked. Hmm. So you know, certainly what I do, and, and you know, traveling the planet as I do, um, I always try and find out what it is you actually want to do. Kind of normalize the technology. If you could have anything, what would you actually like to do? And then here's where ServiceNow fits in. And there will be pieces of the pie that we don't do. It's not a core right. capability right. or our DNA. And that's where we've got some amazing vendors and partners we work with who do fit in in certain places that augment what we do. So on the, transform the transformative nature of, of what you enable, I would imagine most customers are not picking up the phone to call you guys because they, they're all vested in IT transformation, yep. or are they? You know, usually it's a burning issue problem right. and the phone's ringing off the hook and I, I have mean, to get this solved. I mean, a lot of the time, you know, out of adversity comes triumph, right? And they've usually had some very large outage. You know, you know the banks and healthcare, whether from a security breach to ATM networks being down or people not paying bills online, it's typically a compelling event. CIOs tend to have a fairly short lifespan. You know, so what they need to do in that short lifespan is do something different or disruptive, or you know, they're going to be out on their ear kind of thing anyway. Right, right. So there's obviously compelling events, but then when you, you know, technology events around upgrades and moving to new systems, a lot of our comp competitors takes 18 to 24 months. I mean, even the customer I just spoke to downstairs, um, took them a year just to upgrade the software. 
that was our even looking at process change and doing something different. Um, so I think a lot of what we do enables that very simply and easily, and they focus on the what, necessarily the how. Yeah, a lot of times, um, you talk about the CIO, the half-life of a CIO, so you know. Yeah, so, I so, think it's 18 months yeah, now, right? right. So, so uh, but a lot of times CIOs, they, you know, they want to make a mark, but they're risk averse because if there's a disaster under their watch, you yeah. know, they're, they're cooked. Um, it seems like ServiceNow is a, is a great initiative for them to transform relatively low risk, but what are the risks involved? You've been a practitioner yep. you know, on one side. What are the risks that need to be managed when you're, when you're bringing in something like a ServiceNow platform? Yeah, I think you know, we were the first disruptive technology that, that started to challenge us, and, and it's cloud-based, right? You know, so the immediate ones around trust, security, where is my data? If it's not in my four walls of my data center, I feel uncomfortable, right? And with data breaches and everything that goes on in the world, people get very nervous about that stuff. And I think what ServiceNow has brought to the table is, look, you know, we do this well, this is all we do, and we are very, very good at it. And therefore, you can trust us, and oftentimes, you know, we'll put our security up against another customer and say, okay, let's go toe-to-toe, -to -toe and let's prove how good we are and what we've done, and here's you know, all our certifications and, um, and certificates to operate and things like that. And I think then it's just that little bit of mindset. And I think what a lot of people forget is switching out a tool is a tool, right? And it could be any tool, it doesn't matter. There's an organizational change that comes with this. And a lot of our keynotes this morning, and I've worked very closely with Allison at the Coca-Cola company, it's a mindset. And if you can win the hearts and minds and then make the solution complementary to their day-to-day -day tasks, people are going to use it, right. right? And you know, like sending an email, okay, that's fairly simple, but now setting up a meeting, or tweeting or whatever. It's just a natural behavior. It's in, you're out, and you're moving on to the next task. Whereas before, you know, if you were to submit a change request, it was a tedious task because you got technical people doing things that's alien to them and they don't want to. So the more you enable it for how they work on a daily basis, the more chance of success you've got of making it, you know, making it successful. So you mentioned you brought up security, obviously the, the one of the areas that everybody talks about when you go to a cloud. Do you feel like your security is better than most of your customers and prospective customers? Absolutely, and you know, <laughs> I haven't been told to say that. But yeah, I mean, I was at the New York Stock Exchange when we did that implementation. Um, UBS, another great customer in Switzerland. Um, you know, all of those things, it's, you know, let's take the emotion out of the decision-making process. Yes, it feels uncomfortable and it's different, but that's okay. So here's, you know, the facts, the figures, take the politics and the decision-making out of the process. And if you look at just a features comparison and what we do, yeah, we absolutely stack up against everybody else and we beat them in so many cases. And you know, the phenomenal success you see here with the customers, you know, they've done the Kool-Aid, they see what we do and, they, and you know, we have everything from federal to government to financials, pharma, FDA regulated, they're all here. Um, you know, it's clearly working and we've got more work to do as we know, but you know, it, it's a great success story and we're good at what we do. Let's talk a little bit about IT governance. Um, it's just thrown around, it's a buzzword, people are always trying to sort of grasp, get their arms around it. What do you mean by IT governance and how are people using ServiceNow's platform to affect IT sure. governan so governance governance? Typically, initiatives? you know, if you mention the word governance or audit in IT, they run for the hills, right? They're big scary words and typically you'd think people are going to get upset or fired as a result, right? <laughs> someone's going to get um, it. Someone's going to get caught lifting <laughs> the carpet. But I think it's more around the controls and the processes, and in ServiceNow, we have that governance process. We use our own technology to certify our own data centers and our own people for what we need to do to operate. And I think it's more around looking at those operational controls and how do they roll up. And there's a couple of customers here who have passed HIPAA, SOX audits, using ServiceNow out of the box for those controls, those policies, and what they need to do. And with a, you know, a single platform, it's all tightly integrated, the audit team, the governance team, whoever they may be, who aren't always in the IT operations space, who are the practitioners that can really influence this. It's a single system of record joined together. I can now know why they're asking this question or why your, my operational process is this way because it rolls up to a bigger thing that basically says, if I do X, I may expose customer data for the wrong reason. My operational process is this way for a clear reason and I can tie the two together. Whereas if you put an IT guy and a governance person in the room, I mean, it's chalk and cheese, right? <laughs> They're never going to really get on. So the technology really enables that. It brings down the silo and the barriers, and they kind of move on to solving problems. The technology's not in the way. I love the, uh, I love the English idiom, idioms. 
<laughs> Bless your cotton socks. There you go. <laughs> so, all right, we have, we're almost out of time, Chris, but I want to give you the last word. You, you're a practitioner uh, turned you know, a technology evangelist. You've been through it now a few times on yep. the buy side. What advice would you give to fellow practitioners that are trying to get their arms around IT service <coughs> management? They're trying to automate. They've got this, you know, we're seeing a pattern develop, this, this sort of stovepipe mess. What's your main area of advice? I think, you know, think differently and be disruptive, right? Challenge the, the real world operational way of thinking. ITIL, ITSM, there's many frameworks out there. Take what works for you and implement what works best for you. And then find a platform that allows you to focus on solving the problem, not managing the technology. We do that for you and we do it very well. Focus on solving the real problems you've got in your environment. And the technology is a huge enabler for that. And as I said, if you can draw it, you can make it workflow, and then you can automate it. And you only manage the failures and the exceptions. If your process works 98% of the time, you have a very small amount of work to do to solve that last 2%, and you're focusing on the real issues rather than you know, trying to understand the bigger picture. Chris Pope, you got some serious street cred, so I really appreciate you coming on theCUBE and sharing your perspectives and knowledge with our audience. Uh, keep it right there, everybody. So first of all, thank you for coming no, on. Really thank you, guys, I really appreciate it. Thank so you Fred time. Luddy is up next. We're going to have a break, and then Fred Luddy, who developed the ServiceNow platform back in 2003, I believe, started this. We're going to go deep with him, actually on some new announcements that uh, ServiceNow made this week around mobile. So keep it right there. This is theCUBE, I'm Dave Vellante. I'm here with Jeff Frick. Keep watching, everybody. We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs>